Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lazy Road Talk. Hi, I hope everyone um, is enjoying their weekend so far. Summer's almost here. Um, and I've been thinking about ice cream. I've talked so, so much about CCP politics, but I've never talked to you about ice cream and CCP politics. So tonight, uh, we have the chance to talk about ice cream and CCP politics. Um, all right. So people are still joining in. Excellent. Okay, so in the past, if you follow China News, in the past couple of days, there were two major events that caught the attention of Chinese people. One is the Beijing Hospital fire, the deadly fire uh, that killed 29 people, or at least, at least allegedly killed 29 people. It could be more. And the other is the BMW's Mini Cooper ice cream meltdown in Shanghai. The two incidents seem to be unrelated because one is in Shanghai and the other is in Beijing. One is ice and the other is fire, <laughs> ice and fire. But in my, in, in my opinion, they are related. And understanding their relations could help us um, better understand how Beijing controls viral contents and also help us understand the risks of doing business in China. Risk management is a profession now. Multinational companies all have uh, an internal department dedicated to monitoring and controlling the company's risks, right? The company's exposure to risks. I don't know how companies like BMW, Volkswagen, or, or Mercedes-Benz, um, who all have business or operations in China, I don't know how they monitor their risks of doing business in China. I think it must be difficult for them. Uh, due to the lack of awareness of CCP politics, foreign national companies are often caught in this kind of unexpected PR crisis. The BMW Mini ice cream meltdown caused the stock of the, uh, the German automaker a 3.5% dip in one day. So today we'll talk about the risks of doing business in China and we use the BMW Mini Cooper incident as an example, as a case study. So we'll talk about, first of all, what the IBM ice cream incident in Shanghai was all about. We'll take a close look at it. And, this, and then we'll talk about the real factor behind the BMW PR misfortune. And then we'll spend the bulk of tonight to talk about how it's related to uh, a hospital fire in Beijing and then the CCP politics deeply hidden behind all that. And last but not least, we'll quickly talk about can BMW avoid the crisis? Maybe that, that would be a topic open for discussion with all of you. So, <clears throat> so let, me like get, let me get started. So the mini ice cream incident started when a video filmed by a visitor to the Shanghai Auto Show was trending on April 20th. It showed... Um, I'll play you the video in a little bit, but I'll just explain to you what, you, what you're what you going about to see. It showed an upset Chinese man complaining in the, in the beginning. Uh, then you see two young women working at the mini uh, Cooper booth offering free ice cream to a Western man, followed by the man filming the video asking the young ladies about uh, whether they have free ice cream for him. And 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 then um, the last bit is the, the, the guy filming the video, sh panning around the area and showing Westerners eating ice cream. All right, so I'm going to play the video uh, directly from the website. It's in Chinese because there's so many different versions, and I found this version to be, it's probably the most original, and it's clear. Um, so... Let me, I, it's already, I already share the screen with you. So all I have to do is this. Here we go. Um, let me play this. Let me go to the beginning. Uh, 
I want to pause. Uh, if you if you follow Chinese, if you understand Chinese, he he was he's very upset. Obviously, he's talking about a, a young lady wearing glasses, uh, and that's yeah, that's that's kind of what I want to mention here. And here, here is here are the two ladies uh, at the Mini Cooper booth, and they obviously have a stack of ice cream um, there. Uh, before that, I want to show you there were two women, almost like uh, was like br briefly was. Hold on, let me see here. Where is it? Where they go? Some video claimed that the the two women that they were talking to were customers asking for ice cream. I didn't think so. <laughs> Here are two women. I think they are probably people they know. It doesn't look like the woman uh, in front in front of the blonde was upset of not getting ice cream. <laughs> And then came this Western guy. Uh oh, it's saying my internet is not good. Ask me to to wait a little bit. <laughs> it does not want me to play this video. This this um, okay. So let me play a a, a YouTube version. Huh? It's it knows what I'm. <laughs> All right, let me try this. This is this is this doesn't make sense. Maybe it doesn't want me to play this. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, huh? It doesn't let me play. Uh, let me let me just remove this and then share with you another YouTube video. Um, hmm. Okay, sorry. Okay, here, here's the ice cream. Okay, this this one is from YouTube. It's not very clear, but it's essentially the same thing. Let me let me play this. So, this one, the person just added a lot of text. Ignore the text. If you, where were we? Okay, so here, here we go. So they were showing him how to open the ice cream. There's then now you hear the Chinese voice, the person who filmed the, the video asking, "Can I, is this ice cream free? Can I get one? Uh, the person, the girl said, let me take a look. And yeah. And then the girl said that you need to download an app and it's kind of an overseas app and blah, blah. And then they were trying to come up with an excuse not to give this person the ice cream. And the guy kept asking, do you still have ice cream? Do you still have ice cream? And this girl on the right said, well, we have limited quantity. And so they, this guy continued to film them. And they filmed all these Westerners eating ice cream. But notice, okay, so so that's basically the 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 controversy. Let me come back. All right. Um,
let me just get rid of that. So um, the original, the Chinese video is clearer. Um, but here, here are several issues that I saw in the video. First of all, the angry man in the beginning uh, was complaining about a girl wearing glasses. Now, none of, neither of the two girls in the video that we saw wore glasses. And also, he was with people who wore the shirts that says Yi Chu, uh, which is a car info and shopping guide website. So he was most likely not in front of the mini booth. Um, so I'm not convinced if that angry man in the beginning of the video was actually complaining about not getting ice cream because he didn't he didn't mention ice cream at all. Uh, he was c complaining about something else. And also in different versions of the videos, the man appeared in different parts. Like in that video, he appeared in the front. In other ver versions, they move him to the back. So the inconsistency of this angry man made me think that his complaint has nothing to do with the ice cream. Um, so, so basically the video just shows, shows you a Western guy who was later determined to be a employee um, working for a BMW, uh, working up, got ice cream. And then this guy filming the two girls uh, went up after after the Western guy got, got his ice cream and asked, you know, can I get an ice cream or is it free? And then the two girls, you know, were hesitant in giving giving him an ice cream. They didn't really turn him down. They just kind of were, were trying to find excuse. And anyone who's familiar with Chinese culture know they didn't really say a no, but they're trying to, you know, avoid it to say, well, we have a limited quantity or say, yeah, it's like, we, we may be out. I'm not sure. Let me take a look. Um, so I feel very bad for these two young ladies. Now they're like, you know, they're, they, 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 they become the, you know, probably the most hated faces in China right now for, um, you know, giving Westerners a privilege over Chinese. But I really don't see that in them. I think they probably felt a little uncomfortable giving this, giving ice cream to this man who had been filming them all this time. You know, the, the, this guy was actually, and this guy was not alone. The guy who f was filming was with another person and because you could hear her talking in the video. So that was, that was all, you know, to me, there was, there was no really complaining guy in this video because this, this man who was filming, who claimed who posted this video never said in the video that I'm upset that why you're not giving me uh, ice cream? Why, you, why did you give that guy ice cream and you didn't give me any ice cream? He never, he never said it. So, um, so this is just, I don't know where the controversy came, came from at all. Um, but anyways, the video van viral with hundreds of millions of views, uh, within a matter of few days. And people even went further to elaborate and saying things like BMW Mini does not take Chinese customers seriously. I want to make money. It wants to make money, but not, uh, not taking Chinese customers uh, seriously or not respecting Chinese customers. Um, and But BMW is not the only car company. So the things suddenly just were trending. And in the afternoon, several Chinese media said that the two girls who handed out ice cream had left the company and would not be back at the booth. And then the Chinese got even more upset. They, they felt that the BMW didn't address the issue, but punished the two girls. Um, and then so the hashtag about the two young ladies, you know, were let go gotten another 170 million views on that day. So after the video became trending, BMW Mini China apologized in a statement on, on the same day. And then the next morning, <clears throat> the company issued another statement to clarify the incident. It turned out that the Western men, as I said, um, and also the other Westerners sitting near the booth who were eating ice cream, were also um, BMW employees because they had the badge. Um, but the automaker's explanation did little to, to calm public anger. And it continued. 
um, the discussion continued um, on the social media. Now, this has hit the BMW stock price on, on that day. The European shares fell three point, actually 3.62%, not 35 3.62% on April 20th, wiping out 2.16 billion euro um, in, is that, it says, it says um, billion euro in the BMW market value. I, I need to verify that number. Um, but the translation says 2.16 billion euro. And then CNN said this, says, you know, multiple Western media reported this. The footage sparked a firestorm of outrage on the Chinese internet where users lashed out at BMW for apparently giving foreigners preferential treatment. Some called for a boycott of the car maker. As soon as I hear the word boycott of BMW, then it smells very fishy, very suspicious. Um, I don't think the Chinese would be upset over ice cream to boycott a brand unless their government is behind this. Uh, so the entire event didn't look like an organic event in which we had an unhappy man who wanted free ice cream. He was totally mistreated. And then he went mad and then posted the video on internet. It didn't look like that to me. Um, it looked staged to me. So the, now that's, that's not, uh, let, let's talk about what's really behind this because I think that's more interesting. The entire event, okay, what's, what's more troubling is the timing. Okay, the key here is the timing. The video went viral on April 20th two days after a deadly fire broke out in Beijing. And this timing speaks volume of the connection between the fire and then the ice cream. So a deadly fire broke out at noon on March 18th at the Changfeng Hospital in Beijing. Although the fire department was next to the hospital and fire was controlled within an hour, 29 people died. Well, the 29th um, fatality was the number, official number given by the press, by the Chinese state-controlled media. The most incredible aspect about the fire uh, is that no media reported about the fire in, in the capital city for nearly eight hours until 9 p.m. that night. So the fire broke out around noon, and then the news came out around 9 p.m. that night. What's even odd is that when the news about the fire came out, there was no videos or pictures shown. You know how when, when press, when you know, media reported a, a fire, usually you know, they show the vi footage or, or picture, right? something. But on that day, there was no picture or video. And many Beijing residents near the hospital witnessed the fire. They uploaded videos and photos to the internet but their posts were blocked or removed by the authorities, making the fire totally invisible for eight hours until after the official announcement came out. And even after the 29 fatalities were announced, family members of patients um, who were at the hospital were not provided a name list of the victims. So they didn't know why, um, so they didn't know if their loved ones were the uh, uh, were the lost lives in, in the tragedy. But people don't understand. They ask, how do you know there were 29 people who died if you don't know their names, if you don't know who they are? The second thing that smelled very fishy here is the number 29. It's very suspicious. Why? You know, the classification of tragedy in China has, um, ha has a delineate, de delineation or de demarcation demarcation line, shall we say, of 30. Incidents with casualties of 30 or more are called mega incidents or mega tragedies. And below 30 are called major incidents. And the classification of the incidents determine who is responsible for investigation, and that's the key. So major incidents meaning the ones with less than 30 casualties are investigated by the municipal government, the local government. But once the death toll rises to 30 or more, and once it, it becomes a mega accident or incident, 
incident. The investigation would be carried out by the state council, uh, which is in in the hands of the premier. Right, the premier uh, runs the state council. So that brings up a very sensitive issue between two of Xi Jinping's loyal lieutenants. Let me show you pictures. I do have pictures now. So here's the picture of the fire、um, <clears throat> outside the hospital, and here here we have the two、uh, two loyal Xi Jinping's two loyal loyalists. One is the Premier Li Keqiang, I mean Li Qiang, and the other is Cai Qi,、um, the guy who heads up his um um.、Uh, What do you call that? His,、uh, his.、Uh, I call him his chief operations officer.、Um, he runs his household. He, the guy, this guy runs the CCP household. So,、uh, but this guy on the right was the former head of Beijing municipal government. Okay, so he just got promoted. He just left that post last month at the two sessions. So, so he has a strong. So the city government. Pretty much、uh, had been under him for the past five years, right? So basically, the investigation.、Um, so whether it's a,、um, a a mega accident or a major accident, would decide which of the two men that you see here on the screen would be responsible for the investigation, and one of them、uh, had been the head of. Beijing municipal government for the past five years, so to some extent, you know, it will be a reflective of his work for the past five years because the fire, you know, broke in his in his city. Now, here here is the issue.、Um, I I remember I made a video.、Uh, I, I when when did I do this? Maybe a week ago, maybe no more than two weeks ago. I made this video. About who's the second most powerful man in China, and it's about Cai Qi, right?、Um, I argue that this this guy is the second most powerful man、um, within the party, and you know the party always overrules the government. So even though he, even though Li Qiang, who is the premier, who is traditionally believed to be the second in command, but the way Xi Jinping has aligned responsibilities with their titles.、Um, Tells us that Cai Qi is the second most in,、uh, powerful man in China. So there is this contention between the two men. You know, there's the question: Well, of the two, who is the most powerful man? And this fire、um, inadvertently put the competition in front between in front of them, right?、Um, so. So their relationship can be very delicate. Delicate at this point.、Um, so now let me talk about Cai Qi's connection to Xi Jinping from 2017, and this is a great story that I think you will you will enjoy. Fire、uh, is very important. Has played a very important role to Cai Qi. In his political career, because there were two famous fires that linked to him and and Xi Jinping、um, in 2017. So on November 10th, 2017, around 10 a.m., then U.S. President Donald Trump ended his visit to China and left for Vietnam、uh, from Beijing to attend an APEC summit. About an hour after Trump's Air Force One took off from Beijing's Capitol Airport. Xi Jinping's plane also took off as he was heading to, as he was going to Vietnam to attend the same summit. Now, Xi Jinping saw from his plane a huge plume of black smoke coming out, coming from the east of the airport, and his staff told him that the black smoke was a fire at a warehouse in the、uh, Shunyi district of Beijing, but the fire had been put out. Now realizing that Donald Trump must have seen the black smoke of the fire from his Air Force One, Xi Jinping was unhappy about the fire, and said、um, it was such a disgrace, meaning the fire was a disgrace.、Um, 
When Xi Jinping's words were repeated to the city officials, they were very nervous because the big boss was upset about the fire. On November 15th, Xi Jinping returned to Beijing from the APAC meeting and also his trip to um, Southeast Asia. Three days after his return to Beijing, another fire broke out in Beijing, and this time it's deadly. It killed 19 people and injured eight. Well, that's the official casualties. We don't know how many. It could be more. Um, guess who was the party head of Beijing? It was Tai Chi. So Tai was thus um, given the responsibility to do something, right? Because it's two fires within a matter of um, two weeks, less than two weeks, upset the big boss. So Tai immediately launched a four-day campaign, aggressively removing all hazard, including slums and, their, and the residents in those neighborhoods. However, the 40-day campaign wasn't just to deal with fire hazard. It was politically motivated for Tsai. He used it to gain control of the city government, which had been run by a Hu Jintao ally. Here's another background, <laughs> a story within a story. So in 2016, a year before that, there was a famous case in Beijing in which a young man by the name of Lei Yang who was a graduate student detained by Beijing police, and he died less than 30 minutes while in police custody. His death caused a public outcry. His family, friends, professors, and, um, and basically people in, in academia from Beijing demanded a thorough investigation. Xi Jinping ordered, um, it was during Xi Jinping's first term, at the end of his first term, he ordered a thorough investigation of the case and uh, arrested several policemen, including the deputy chief of the police station. However, I think it was under the maneuver of Xi Jinping's political enemy, thousands of police, police officers in Beijing threatened resignation if the investigation continued. Uh, this shocked Xi Jinping tremendously, and he backed down. The authorities eventually gave the young man's family some money and closed the case. This, however, made Xi Jinping realize that he didn't have full control over the municipal government um, of the capital city. Uh, that was in 2016. He then sent Tai Chi, uh, a protagonist in, this, in the story, to be the leader of the city government of Beijing. So how did, but you know, if he just changed the head, the, 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 the head of, the, of the city government, I mean, he's powerless because the entire system, the entire government is full of people loyal to the previous leadership, right? So how is he gonna change much? So, so, so how did Tsai regain control of the Beijing government? Well, he used the two fires that I mentioned earlier. In the name of investigating the fires and eliminating hazard, Tsai cleaned out the influence of the other political factions within the Beijing city government. Um, and then he put in his people. He has been in that position until last month when he became Xi Jinping's chief, what I call chief administration officer or chief operation officer. Basically, he runs the CCP household. For Xi Jinping. Um, so that's that's the history with uh, Tai Chi and and the fires between him and, and Xi Jinping. And precisely because Tai Chi used a fire or two fires to take down his political opponents, he's not going to let Li Qiang, um, the premier, right here who is competing for the second position with him to investigate the fire in his former city government, right? And that's why for the, for the eight hours from noon to 9 p.m., the, the whole government delayed the announcement, trying to figure out who's going to investigate the fire. If the fatalities goes over 29, then the Chang State Council would, be, would, would, would conduct it. So they eventually agreed to announce the fatality at 29, effectively putting 
um, the city government to handle it. And that's why they didn't have a list of deceased names, because I think the number was arbitrary. The actual casualties must be higher than, um, than 30, because if it's under 30, then there's no dispute. Um, then it would be, it would be um, the city government. You know, the, the, it was definitely over 30. And then so they, they had this uh, argument or, or negotiation, shall we say. Uh, that just shows you how efficient the Chinese government is when it comes to rescue effort, um, because <laughs> politics comes before human life. Now, let's talk about how is, how is that related to BMW, because, right, because we, we want to talk about BMW. Now, a fire in the hospital killing dozens of patients in the capital city is a major national news, and its delay and cover-up piqued more public interest. On the day following the fire, the topic was trending because people wanted to know what happened at the hospital. You know how Chinese, anything happened in the, in the, in the capital city um, involving, involving, you know, that has like fatalities, you know, make people think about what happened, what really happened, right? So, uh, so it piqued a lot of public interest uh, and then also the fact that the government delayed it, you know, piqued more interest. This, however, was not what the CCP leaders wanted. Xi Jinping is very sensitive to fire. Last year, um, a fire in, in an apartment building at night in Ulumuqi caused the white paper movement and ended zero COVID. Um, it's still fresh on people's mind. It's certainly still on Xi Jinping's mind. I made a video titled Xi Jinping's Back Lock with Fire. Um, yeah, here it is. I think this video was made last fall. You, you, I, I provided the links in the description of the video. You can you can check check them out. It's already there. I did that before. I did my homework before the, before the live stream. I usually do it afterwards, but I, I did it. Um, ahead of time. So Xi Jinping's rule has been inundated with unfortunate fires. Um, a fire in the capital city is too sensitive for people to discuss. So it's a no-no. You know, every time the CCP wants to let a sensitive trending topic die down, they create some sensation, sensational stories uh, to kind of divert public attention Typically, they use things like celebrity scandals, like the story of um, a famous pianist uh, visiting a prostitute, you know, things like that, scandals like that, that will immediately pull public attention away. So in this case, they needed another viral event to divert public attention from the Beijing fire. Now, I don't want to say this video, this ice cream video was intentionally created for that purpose, although I do have a question about, you know, the, 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 the condition under which the video was filmed. Um, but let's just say, even if it's original, right, by an upset customer over ice cream, let's just even say that's, that's how it was created, it can still be used to start a storm for BMW. Chinese netizens upload millions, if not tens of millions of videos every day, of which Beijing certainly can find one or a few videos that can best counter the Beijing fire. How about a video that can arouse a pro-China sentiment against a German company? Hey, didn't the German foreign minister strike a more hardline tone than the one from Emmanuel Macron? How about a video to get even with the Germans? With the help of the CCP's centrally controlled algorithm, BMW's ice cream video, unfortunately, went trending. Well, is there anything BMW can do to prevent it? I don't think so. Not really. They can't. Because they can't predict. I mean, how are they? I mean, they can better manage their booth. They can better manage the supply of ice cream. They could do all of that. But they cannot prevent some event right? That's a fire that, that, that happened in the capital city and the need, CCP's need to, um, to put out the fire. 
So this is a major risk of doing business in China for foreign national companies because this is something they have absolutely no control over. This incident is reminiscent of the Tesla PR crisis at the same event two years ago, at the 2021 Shanghai Auto Show. Remember this picture? A woman from Henan showed up at the Tesla booth,、um, wearing a white shirt with Tesla logo and the word、um, "brake failure" on it. No one knew how the woman got in because it was—I think it was on a press day. It was on a press day. It wasn't a public day. So how how did the woman come in? How how the women came in、um, was was interesting, and because it was all press there, so the the story、uh, the the woman the, some some people say the woman obviously got some help from the from the auto show to be able to climb up a Tesla Model Three and shouted Tesla brake failure. Like for for quite some time on the rooftop, you know Chinese security is able to take down, you know, a person, a protester within a matter of seconds. How did they let this woman stand on the on the rooftop of a Tesla Model Three and shout? So and then mainland media quickly blasted Tesla's safety record, you know, and setting up a PR storm for for the EV maker. So this is one of the reasons why Tesla was absent from this year's Shanghai Auto Show. It just didn't bother. <laughs> so this is risk number two for foreign brand, right? If these kind of a public public event, I mean,、uh, shows, you don't know if it will actually,、uh, you don't know if it's a plus to your brand. Recognition, or if it's a minus, in the case of Tesla, attending the Shanghai Auto Show two years ago was was a minus. So that's why they stopped going. Tesla didn't bother to go because even they could save a lot more money, lot of money, and then save、um, negative publicity. So so if if Beijing wants to help its domestic brands to compete with a foreign brand. There's nothing BMW or Tesla can do, right? So that's risk number two. Num- risk number one is the political factor that you have absolutely no control, and risk number two is、uh, a commercial risk, right? If the if Beijing wants to <clears throat> get at you to help its domestic brands, then you, you, there's nothing you can do. Chinese financial magazine Caixin contacted BMW China and found that the two young ladies are not BMW employees, and they were hired by a third-party service provider, probably you know、uh, to help with the, the the show. Actually, I don't need this, and they have not been fired.、Um, so hiring a local event or PR company to handle auto show is a common practice for 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 na- multinational companies. It's not a problem in other parts of the world, but in China, this can be problematic because the boss of the two young ladies、uh, who work for the event, who work for the who works for the event company, might likely have told them, "Hey, don't give out all the ice cream. Save some for the staff." Right, that's a very typical Chinese mentality, and then the two women did just that. And BMW has no control over the operations or the practices of these local Chinese companies they hire,、um, because they follow a different standard from BMW, and it would be mission impossible for BMW. So the question is, well, should BMW follow a Chinese standard and Chinese protocol when they operate in China? If they do, then they they would lose their Western brand prestige. They would sooner or later become a Chinese brand if they follow Chinese standard and protocol. But if they follow a Western standard, they would have to devote a lot of resources in training the third party vendor, like in this case the the company that 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 hosted the the the, the ice cream、uh, booth. And it's very difficult.、Um, I think it's impossible. Um, I think it will it will cost West brand Western brands a lot of money to truly bring、uh, their operation in China up to Western standard. Like, okay, let's say you just say, okay, let's just offer ice cream 
to anyone who asks. Unlimited ice cream. Chinese can abuse that. Okay, not only the maybe you don't care if the um, the the auto show goers abuse that. The the third party vendors may abuse that. Okay, there are just so many people in the system who who may abuse your generosity, and then you may find out it's just not worth it. I may as well just not offer any ice cream. Um, so it's just very, very costly to, to bring your Chinese operation up to a Western standard. So you're stuck. So these Western brands, uh, from my observation, are stuck in between this, um, do you do things the Chinese way or do you do things Western way? Right, and then, so sometimes, so what they do is they they take this middle ground. They sometimes they do things Chinese way, and sometimes they do things Western ways, and that's what caused them troubles. That's exactly what happened here, because anything that went wrong, you'll be blamed, because you're held to the highest standard by everyone, whether it's Chinese government, Chinese customers, or even Western investors or Western customers. You are being held against a very high Western standard. And then anything goes wrong, your stock tank. So that's what happened. And this is also a big risk of Western brands in China. I don't know how they're going to, I mean, in their statement, they said that they're going to enforce uh, improved training of their staff. But I think they may as well just stop giving out ice cream because I don't see how it's going to work. Um, a little miscommunication. And even I think the two girls, if you, if you watch the video, the two girls didn't do anything outrageous. You know, I mean, they didn't, it was, it was fine. So it was manipulated. So that's the three risks I concluded from this incident, political risk, and then a, a marketing, a, a brand awareness risk, and then an operation risk. And, and all of them become a risk because of the unique uh, political system of China, shall we say. Now, I want to give you an update on the fire. The, regarding the fire at the hospital, it was caused by a series of problems at the hospital. The hospital has a lot of problems. First of all, it's known for having safety, fire safety issues. Uh, and also, the hospital has been losing money with a reported operating loss of 13 million yuan in 2021. It has not released its financial statement of 2022, um, probably because of its not so pretty financial situation in 2022. It also has a serious debt problem with a total almost half billion dollar, I mean, half billion yuan worth of debt, 462 million yuan worth of debt. And going to this year, the hospital uh, is relying on borrowing more money to maintain operations. So the problems at this hospital is, uh, is just a snapshot of, um, of the many problems that many Chinese businesses face, debt being in the red, cash flow problems, and safety hazard. So that's why Beijing wants this fire story to disappear. All right, so I just finished my presentation. I hope this is uh, interesting and helpful. I just thought it it's, it's um <laughs> it's time to talk about ice cream and CCP politics because I wouldn't it would be very rare uh, occasion to be able to talk about the two so I seized that opportunity and it really enjoyed the the uh, the the chance of of doing this this presentation all right let me see if people have questions for me um. Now I want to eat ice cream. <laughs> Don't we want to have some ice cream? All right. So let me see if I have any questions. Let me go through the super chats. Um, some ice cream would be nice. Travel with love. Happy Saturday, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the for the nice note. Yes. Happy Saturday, everyone. All right. Let me see. Um. Let me see. Any questions for me? Ice cream. <laughs> Someone said ice cream. All right. Yeah, we're all we're all thinking about ice cream. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, if not, question will end here. 
<laughs> Lao Gan Ma flavored ice cream. Some of Hong Kong underground. Lao Gan Ma is the spicy, super spicy chili sauce from Sichuan. I have not had a. I have not had a. a Uh, a chili flavored ice cream. Have you guys have chili chili flavored ice cream? That would be interesting. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. What? No ice cream for me. Okay. All right. All right. So if not, we'll end it here. <laughs> Uh, it's from from Johnny, is this Chinese culture manipulative or just the CCP? I don't think Chinese culture is manipulative. Um, if you follow if you follow what Confucius Confucius teaching, uh, Confucius teachings is the cor um are the cornerstone of the traditional Chinese values in guiding. How to deal with with each other?、Um, Confucius teachings focused on how to deal with family members, how to deal with、uh, your boss, how to deal with your emperor, right? So, and because the whole Chinese culture believe in a harmonious relationship, right? A balance of yin and yang, and harmony, right? So, so a lot of harmony and balance. Um, respect, right? Always respect. So I don't see how it can be manipulative,、um, but that seems to be forgotten in today's China, or that has been eliminated after the Cultural Revolution. After the CCP killed traditional Chinese culture during the Cultural Revolution, we, we've been turned into、um, a nation that's very com combative,、uh, competitive. Argumentative is that the word? Argumentative. I don't know how do you say that.、Um, people cannot take a no as an answer.、Um, they cannot. They cannot stand losses. They always want to win. They always want to beat out their opponents. So this, I think, it's very CCP. It's not Chinese at all.、Um, from Alan Mendel. Has there been a COVID outbreak in any city recently? I have seen COVID.、Um, I have seen like random news about COVID lockdowns、um, posted, and then some people discredit it. I have not been able to verify it, but somewhere I've seen、um, COVID tests have been resumed in some parts of China, and some people claim that lockdowns have returned. So. Uh, but they are sporadic, and I haven't got the chance to verify that. But, but there are news about them popping, you know, popping up here and there. So, just to answer your question, thank you, Simon, Simon Robinson, for the for the donation. Okay. All right. So, let me see. Any other que good question? Um. Um. Someone. Someone, I don't know if it's a question addressed to me. You never told me your favorite ice cream, vanilla. The simpler, the better. Maybe green tea. I like vanilla ice cream.、Uh, green tea is my second favorite. Yeah, I think those two.、Um, <laughs> we're talking about ice cream. All right.、Um, all right. Chili chat on ice cream. All right. A、uh, quick question about Simon Robinson about the Chinese GDP. What I want to know is what is the Renminbi and Hong Kong dollar really worth? Not much in my view. Therefore, their GDP low. Um, that's a that's an interesting. I mean, um, that's a question that I that I need to spend some time doing research. I can't really answer that. Um, um, yeah. But it's the Hong Kong dollar is, you know,、um, this this is this is in interesting. You know, countries that have agreed to trade with China in renminbi, I think have been got 
you know, exchange the RMB with Hong Kong dollar, because Hong Hong Kong dollar is a is a uh, is is a tradable currency. So somebody was just saying that if you look at Hong Kong, Hong Kong's currency reserve it has gone down. So Hong Kong has been hit with this um with this trade agreement in Chinese in RMB currency. So that's just um when you mentioned the two currencies, I that just came to my mind. All right, so if not, we'll end it here, and uh, <laughs> we'll all go eat ice cream. How's that? All righty, thank you very much. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you, bye, bye. <laughs>